Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to focus on really kind of the culmination of the civil rights movement. And we're going to start with first the legislation that's passed on a national level. Uh, really kind of reflects all of the work of the civil rights organizations that we talked about the other day, like the SCLC, the SNCC, the NAACP, all are kind of working for some kind of national recognition and national anti segregation and implementation of voting rights uh, in the United States. And then we're going to talk about where the civil rights movement goes because you start to have people who are challenging Martin Luther King's nonviolent approach um, and some of the racial tension that ensues in both the South and the North during this civil rights movement. So we're going to start with the key legislation that's passed. So this is really a continuation from yesterday's lesson. Uh, yesterday we ended with uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Uh, and that's at the March on Washington in 1963, and they're trying to convince the president, convince Congress to pass some kind of massive civil rights legislation to guarantee equal protection under the law um, to black Americans. <coughs> now, what this culminates in is the signing of this a very the very um, iconic Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in a lot of ways is very similar to the Civil Rights Act of 1865. It's granting equality to black people under the law. Um, it's making segregation illegal across the United States. So in a lot of ways what it's doing is it's kind of re-cementing this idea that was brought up during Reconstruction that um, everybody's equal before the law, uh, what was put in the 14th Amendment, um, an end to segregation across the United States in all public facilities. Uh, so it, this is a major, major step. Um, and you can see uh, Martin Luther King here in the background. He's there at the signing of the bill by President Lyndon Johnson. At this point, President Kennedy has been assassinated and uh, his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, takes over. Now, surprisingly, Johnson is very progressive. He's a southerner, and so you probably wouldn't expect him to be, um, you know, fighting for the poor and fighting for uh, black Americans' rights, but he really has become a great advocate for uh, the civil rights movement. So this is the first big national piece of legislation that's passed. The second big piece of legislation that Johnson also signed into law is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And what this act essentially does is it makes illegal all of those dis disfranchisement methods that we talked about that were put into place during the New South era. Uh, so you remember we talked about the poll taxes, the grandfather clauses, uh, the literacy test, all of those different things that different southern states put into place to really just to limit African Americans from voting. The Voting Rights Act really makes all of those things illegal uh, for southern states to do. So and essentially it's opening up the franchise, really opening up the franchise to black people in the United States. So these two pieces of legislation, these are huge pieces of legislation. This is the culmination of the entire civil rights movement to get these two pieces of legislation passed. Um, and so President Johnson is the one who signs it into law, but it's the work of a lot of civil rights leaders um, pressuring the government at the state, the local level, and then finally here you know, at the national level. Now kind of during the 60s, um, both before this legislation is passed and after this legislation is passed, you're going to see some real tension. So there's a couple of different movements that are kind of breaking off from the civil rights movement. Um, so the, the first one we're going to call like the black separatist movement. Um, and they break, there's a couple of different groups that fall into this category. So the first one would be the black Muslim movement. Um, so their leader is a guy named Malcolm X, who many of you guys probably uh, know. Now, Malcolm X, <coughs> Malcolm X is, you know, the leader of this, this movement. And essentially, um, their philosophy in a lot of ways is similar to an earlier civil rights leader that we talked about, Marcus Garvey. Um, their belief is that America is kind of an inherently racist society um, and that black people essentially have to kind of look out for their own people. Uh, and so they throw another element into it. They throw Christianity and Islam into it. What they say is Christianity is essentially a religion of white people. And Islam is a religion of color. Um, and therefore, you know, black people should basically convert, convert to Islam because it's a, it's a non-racist religion. So they kind of put the religious aspect into the, 
um, the social and cultural hierarchy of the United States, and they lump that in with the racial aspect as well. And they're going to gain some followers. So most famously, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, the famous boxer. His, his original name is Cassius Clay, and then he converts to Islam and joins the Black Muslim movement. He uh, renames himself, or is renamed Muhammad Ali. Now, they're kind of a part of a, a larger movement, I guess we would call the Black Power Movement, which is trying to empower black people across the United States. Um, so these groups of people, um, they're a little, their mentality is a little bit different than Martin Luther King. Their mentality is um, essentially that maybe integration can't work, um, that, you know, essentially uh, black people have to empower themselves and rely on uh, one another. And if they have to be violent in order to achieve these things, then they, then they will be violent in order to achieve them. Uh, and so, you know, these are some of their, their, their posters, some of their famous speakers speaking on um, the different groups. Now, um, you saw kind of like the Black Power Movement. This is the, the 1968 uh, Olympics. Um, and what they're doing here is they're protesting. Uh, this is during the National Anthem. They won the gold and silver medals, these two Olympians. Um, but during the uh, the National Anthem, they put their, you know, their fist in the air with the black glove and they were protesting essentially what they saw as like the oppression of black people in the United States. Um, and this was on the national stage and it got national attention. Uh, and they actually got stripped of their medals for doing this. The United States took their medals away from them um, for doing this on the national stage. Now, uh, one of the most famous groups that are part of the Black Power Movement um, are the Black Panthers. So the Black Panthers, um, they're kind of like a militant black group. And what they would do is they're like a paramilitary group. They would do training. Um, you see them here with their, you know, with their rifles and their weapons. Um, they would do training and they're kind of preparing for a potential racial conflict or a race war that might happen um, in the United States. And again, they kind of share the mentality that... Um, white America is two races of a, of a society and that, you know, it will never, uh, integration will ne never necessarily work or it won't work without violence on the part of, you know, African Americans to fight for what they um, need and deserve in American society. So this is a very different philosophy than Martin Luther King. Um, it's a philosophy that when you're younger, you're not really introduced to. You're only introduced to Martin Luther King as the only element of the civil rights movement. He is a huge part of it. Um, but you do have these splinter groups that don't agree with him, who do agree and believe in a more violent, um, revolutionary kind of approach to dealing with the racism in American society. Now, the 60s is a very tumultuous time. Uh, there's lots of racial tension, there's racial violence, there's assassinations happening all over the country. So we're going to go through some of the key assassinations that happen. A lot of the major figures of the 60s are assassinated. So... Um, First major assassination of the 60s is, uh, you know, the assassination of President Kennedy. Um, and so he's assassinated by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about um, the assassination of President Kennedy. I tend to believe the, the simplest theory that it was actually Lee Harvey Oswald that did it. Um, but if you want to subscribe to a conspiracy theory about the, <coughs> about the assassination, you know, that's entirely up to you. Um, but he's the first major political figure that is assassinated during the era. Um, and he's assassinated uh, while he's giving a speech, or excuse me, while he's, uh, you know, on a, basically in a convoy, in a parade in, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Martin Luther King is also assassinated later in the 1960s and 1968. So his assassin is James Earl Ray. Uh, and so he's opposed to Martin Luther King's, uh, what he's fighting for and his beliefs. Uh, and so he assassinates Martin Luther King while he's basically on a balcony in, uh, in a hotel room. Uh, next major political figure that's assassinated during the 60s is uh, Robert Kennedy. So JFK's brother is also assassinated. He was running for the presidency in 1968, uh, and he was actually the front runner. He was the Democratic front runner. Um, and this guy assassinates him, Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, and so this is actually America, one of America's first... Uh, taste with Islamic extremism. Uh, and so like this has nothing really to do with the civil rights movement or the racial tension during the 60s. This is, like, has to do more with American foreign policy and some of the things that Bobby Kennedy had expressed. And so he gets assassinated. Uh, Malcolm X is also assassinated during the 60s. Uh, he's assassinated by one of his own followers. So another black Muslim within his group assassinates Malcolm X. So there's all kinds of like major political figures being assassinated. 
uh, during the 60s. Now, some other potential or other sources of violence and tension throughout the era. So I mentioned this in class, but in the North, you have a lot of what's called de facto segregation. So like when they pass the Civil Rights Act, um, it's forcing integration. Brown versus the Board of Education is forcing integration within certain communities. But in the North, a lot of the segregation is simply by where you live, like your neighborhood. Um, and so essentially the North kind of avoids some of the forced integration that happens in the 50s and the early 60s. Um, but they start to pass legislation in places like New York City and Boston to force integration in a different way. Um, so what they do is they, they implement the, these uh, busing programs. So essentially, if you had, let's say, like a predominantly African-American community like Jamaica, Queens, uh, and you had a predominantly white community like Fresh Meadows, Queens, what they would do is they would bus students from Jamaica into schools in uh, Fresh Meadows. Um, so this was kind of like... Uh, Busing and this happened in the late 60s and in, in New York City happened in the early 70s um, So this also caused lots of tension. So I mentioned this in class. So this happened. It happened at Francis Lewis High School and uh, This is something that's not publicized by the school and pro for good reason Basically what happens in the, in the late 60s early 70s in Francis Lewis is you have a ton of racial violence and tension um, bordering on you know riot level of just tension and you know awful kind of violence happening at Francis Lewis uh, and it goes on for a couple of years where it's really really high tension at the school um, and we're not alone this is happening in other schools in New York City other schools around the country mm -hmm. so some of the worst tension that you're gonna see happening in the country is gonna happen in Boston um, with their force busing integration um, some real extreme violence breaks out when they try to integrate Boston schools and um, through the busing programs um, and this is a, a infamous photograph. Um, so this student here, um, this is during a four, like, a, you know, trying to integrate the schools. This student is basically trying to impale um, this African-American student um, with the American flag. Uh, and, you know, it's a wild story because this guy, I guess, kind of had almost like an out-of-body experience because he sees the photograph the next day um, when he's riding on the subway. And he doesn't even realize that it was him that was doing this, um, that was trying to kill this guy with the American flag. And so, you know, like tension is real high in the country, especially on, you know, when it comes to race and um, all these, you know, these hot button topics of the era. And it explodes in cities all across America. So what you're looking at here are places that we had race riots in the 1960s. Um, so it's all across the country. So it's 1965 through 1968. We have some pretty extensive race riots. Uh, if you notice the map, most of these things are happening in the north. Okay, you have some race riots in the south, but most of them are in the north. Think Great Migration, big communities of black people moving to the north, and you're you're dealing with a lot of tension breaking out as all these things are changing. Whenever you're trying to change a society, it's going to lead to lots of tension. So some of your most infamous riots that break out are going to happen in Los Angeles. Uh, these are, this is the first one, the Watts riots in Los Angeles. Um, and a lot of these riots are um, started by the black communities um, in these cities, which is different. When we've had race riots in the past, in like the early teens, late 1800s, a lot of them were started by the white communities um, and targeting uh, black citizens. And a lot of these riots is the opposite. You have black communities starting riots and targeting white citizens in the cities. Um, Detroit, this is also an awful riot. Uh, it's so bad they have to bring the army in to stop the rioting from happening in the city. Uh, so you have just like some awful, awful tension breaking out across the United States. And so the, uh, the people like to say, you know, that let's say now, like now is such a dangerous time period. You have terrorism, you have these school shootings that take place, these mass, mass explosions. I always like to put it into relative context. If you think back at the 60s, the 70s, this was a violent time period too. It's violence in a different way. Um, it's violence in rioting, it's violence in, um, you know, through school integration and other kinds of violence, maybe on a more localized level. Um, maybe not as random as the violence of today, but it's still definitely, you know, you're facing extreme violence. So like I said before, whenever you're gonna have massive change in a society, you're going to be dealing with backlash, tension, um, 
and really uh, all kinds of ramifications from the change you're trying to bring to the society. All right, guys, so I'll see you guys on Monday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Don't forget, now's the time. Start to study for the AP test.